Thank you for joining us at ID Sports as we talk about the NFL Week 3. We are talking about the biggest stories of the week. We are giving our top players. We are giving some uh, players to pump the brakes on and taking a look in the rearview mirror at the tips and tricks we gave during our last episode to see what came true. Thank you for joining us here at IED Sports. Steve's here. Yep, I'm back. You know, back from New York. Had a great time. Let you know, didn't get to see any week three games except for Sunday and Monday night. So, so let's talk about the uh, big story, and that is the um, Ravens win on a uh, 66 yard field goal by Justin Tucker. Yes, it took a 66 yard field goal for the Ravens to beat the Lions this weekend. That is a record for for this field goal. Justin Tucker is kind of the uh, star of the moment, and he's the player we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, I know that there's controversy that, you know, that that it shouldn't have even happened, that the Ravens should have been called for a delay of game. I get it. Uh, But, you know, the thing is, is it not only took the it not only took, you know, a 66 yarder, but it took a 66 yarder that doinked on the bar. And then, you, you know, nine times out of 10, when that thing doinks, it doesn't doink in, it doinks back. So he got incredibly lucky. Thank you for giving me so many wonderful sound bites to dig up over the next 24 hours. Let's move on to talk about KJ Hamler. Torn ACL. Yeah. Broncos already lost Jerry Judy. Now they have Sutton and Tim Patrick as their one two combo. Tim Patrick, a pretty big, nice, tall size receiver, someone that I might be looking for this week. They are 3 0 now, but they beat the Giants, the Jaguars, and the Jets. They face off against those Ravens next week so broncos tough times ahead and they'll be without their top two draft picks from last season yeah um judy's out should be out another four weeks but you know the the broncos of their the broncos opponents have been a combined nine and oh so you got to play your schedule but i'm actually more concerned with their injuries than their uh injuries on defense than i am on their offense now let's finish up and talk a little bit about the Sunday night football game. Packers 49ers had also another suspenseful ending. 49ers leaving seconds on the clock for Aaron Rodgers with zero timeouts. Ends up getting down the field on two completions. He's in field goal range, spikes the ball. Story of the game could be the refs missing some huge calls, including a targeting call on Devontae Adams. Multiple bad calls throughout the game, which all seem to be against the Packers. Packers should have, up, been, should have been up by 14 or 21 points when the game ended. Poor officiating leads to a suspenseful game, uh, but all is right with the world, and the Packers win. Yeah, I mean, you know, and those la- and it should be appropriate that Devontae Adams was the one who got the last two um, throws to set up the field goal. So, you know, I mean, hey, it was, it was, it was a fun watch. So, Now let's take a look at our high-performance players of the week. Your I-80 Sports High Performance Players of the Week. Start at the top. Josh Allen helped the Bills beat Washington 43-21. to He had 32 completions for 358 yards and four touchdowns. If that wasn't enough, he added four rushes only for nine yards and found a touchdown. <laughs> I mean, it, the stallion is finally out, so you know we'll see. He has some favorable matchups coming up, so we'll see. You have a uh, running back to add to that. Oh yeah, I, I mean, <sighs> the Steelers are not gonna do much this year. I am, I am going to admit that now. I'll, They're I'll, bad. Yeah, it's Big gonna be tank tank. Yeah, it's going to be bad this year, but at least Najee is is really produced over the last two weeks. This week, he really came through 14 carries, 40 yards, 14 receptions for 102 yards. When Juju went down with the rib injury, it was all on Claypool and Najee and Claypool had a few had nine for 94. And, um, you know, the Steelers O-line, it's just struggling, but Najee is still producing through the air. Absolutely. 14 carries, 14 receptions. You don't often, when we talk about 50-50 splits, talk about a running back and his rushing and receiving uh, totals. Let's move on to talk about another great split for a running back, and that is Kareem Hunt. He had 10 rushes for 81 yards and a touchdown. He also added six 
receptions for 74 yards. Nice volume. I mean, you had Chubb who had only 22 carries for 84 yards. That's good work for Chubb. But if I'm a a hunt owner, 16 carries for your running back two, maybe your running back three, and he's going to pull off 150 yards for you. I'll take that all day. He fell in the end zone and really made it a week. Yeah, with with OBJ only getting 64% of the snaps in his return, you know, uh, and uh, like the other receivers like Donovan Peoples-Jones and, and Austin Schwartz, like they got nothing done. So things had to be filtered basically through the tight ends, Kareem Hunt and uh, Nick Chubb. And, you know, like, you know, Nick Chubb had the 22 carries for eight, uh, for 84 yards, like you said. You know, that's still that's still good production. If he had just gotten a, like a reception or two, he would have had over 10 points. No, but he doesn't need any. Those are Kareem Hunts. Don't even talk about the receptions Why? in Nick this Chubb Browns backfield. Back. Talk about your next wide receiver. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to stick with one, with one of my favorites, Adam Thielen, um, six receptions, 50 yards in a tutty. Uh, you know, he Thielen has had four touchdowns so far this season, and it's only week three. I, 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 you know, I know it's early in the season, but I just did some math just for the fun of it. He's on pace for 23 touchdowns this season. I'm okay with all of that. Someone who was underrated a little bit heading into this season. We, we talk about Kirk Cousins, and maybe he was taking a little slack there. But Adam Thielen's just been good since he's been in the league. He's, he's been mm-hmm. on a very um, top tier of wide receivers, and people were fading him this year for yeah. the reason of I don't know. Adam and, and, Thielen is uh, putting some respect on his name in the first half of the season here. Exactly. I, okay, just for fun. Over, under, 18 touchdowns for Thielen this under. season. Under. Go Come under. on. It comes back. He'll have... <laughs> if you talk... I mean, in a three-week span, he had four touchdowns. If that happened weeks seven through nine, no one would even bat an eye. It's like when someone hits two home runs in their first two baseball games. Like, it gets blown out of proportion. Let's move on and talk about a wide receiver who we are going to look at as being productive throughout the season, and that's Jamar Chase. This year, this week, he had four receptions for 65 yards and two touchdowns, but it looked beautiful connecting with his old college quarterback, Joe Burrow, who also showed out in this game against the Steelers. They were winning 24 to 10, and Jamar Chase, 65 yards isn't gaudy. Two touchdowns is very good. But the style in which they came, some beautiful, beautiful soft hands. Take a look at that if you get a chance. Jamar Chase highlights from week three. Oh, yeah. I mean, I did see a couple of highlights from that. You know, you got to give props where props is due. And we could we could totally say that the that the camp story of him possibly splitting um, receptions with Auden Tate. Like I called that 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 story was complete bull. I called it on Twitter. I think I, I think everyone here. called that. Yes. Yeah, that was such baloney, and I'm and I'm so glad to see that this kid is thriving. And your last pick? Um, I'm going with my with another one of my favorites, George Kittle. He isn't known for for being a touchdown tight end, but he's always been known for his yardage and yak. And Kittle finally got it going against the Packers, and he came cl- so close to that touchdown that would have that would have given him a higher week. Um, I believe Kittle finished in the top three. Yes, he finished in the top three for tight ends. You know, just good on him. Let's talk about the, uh, before we break up, the last three, the top three players of each position for the week. Yeah, you know, we got Josh Allen, J- Justin Herbert, Stafford. You know, th- that led our quarterbacks there. No surprise is there. We got we got Zeke, Kareem Hunt, and James Robinson. Robinson finally living up to that draft capital. Take it away with the wide receivers and Titan, Bob. We got Mike Williams, Cooper Cup, and Devontae Adams. No surprises there at wide receiver. Although, uh, I, well, I guess Mike Williams was kind of the uh, star of the week that we didn't talk about yet. And tight ends, you got... Dalton Schultz, Tyler Conklin, and Travis Kelsey proving that tight ends don't really matter unless you grab one of the top two. The (laughs) uh, two through nine are all the same. It's been just a mess of the tight end position. I did earlier this year predict that the tight end was going to be a big cluster of players who would produce equally. I thought they would be producing equally equally well. Instead, they have been producing equally poorly, but it doesn't matter because (laughs) if you drafted them, it's still the same value. I love yeah. it. It's been a great th- week three. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, pumping the brakes here, though. Not so fast. It's time to pump the brakes. 
pumping the brakes on TJ Hawkinson. He was supposed to have a great week. He had a perfect matchup against the 32nd ranked tight end defense. Two receptions on two targets for 10 yards against the Ravens. This is what I've been looking forward to for three weeks now. Even worse, we saw Mark Ingram go five for 109, the only receiver in this whole game over 70 yards on the other side of the ball. TJ Hawkinson, bump the brakes. I mean, you know, when TJ Hawkinson is your only good, reliable pass catcher, the defense is going to ske- try to scheme him out of the game. You know, it, it, when when we talk about the Ravens' first two weeks matchups, you know, with the with the tight ends and everything going ham on them, it, it, they had other players around them. But on the Lions, it's just Hawkinson. It's just Swift. It's just Jamal Williams. It, you know, so well, you need just three guys. I mean, you got you got to get your best players open. But two of open. them are running backs. None of them are great wide receivers. I mean, it, it, we were talking last week. Should Quintez Cephas be a thing because he's had touchdowns two weeks in a row? Turns out, no, he shouldn't be a thing. So you know, ah, but I, I'm gonna get started on my pump the brakes, and I'm going with the rookie QBs here. <laughs> here's where the rookie QBs stand so far. Trevor Lawrence. He's, he's QB 28. Mac Jones, QB 29. Zach Wilson, QB 30. Davis Mills, QB 33. Justin Fields, QB 35. And Trey Lance, QB 37. Guess which one is the only one that has an excuse to have their ADP be so low right now? I'm going to go with, uh, well, I would go with Trey Lance, Justin Fields, about a 50-50 split. I, I mean, Field started. Uh, Field started a game and a half, so he should he should have much more. A ga- he may have started a game and a half, but he spent three quarters of a game on his back. Yeah, that's true. But Trey Lance is the only one with an excuse because he's only gotten like five or six snaps. But the rest of the rookie QBs are just not producing like the, like we thought they would. Trevor, and, Tre- um, Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson had okay week ones, but have not been great since. Like take for take for example, just just taking Trevor Lawrence, he had over twenty points in his first in his first start, twenty two point eight. Since then, he's at 8.82 and 7.46 in um, in half PPR. Absolutely. I would say that that is a product not only of the player, but they were drafted high for a reason, and it was because the teams they were drafted to stink. Trevor, Will, uh, Trevor Lawrence is going to have a fine career. He's going to bounce back and be fine. He's going to be a great fantasy asset. Mac Jones was always only going to be a dink and dunk guy. Zach Wilson is a jet, and we're going to talk about that a little later. But I want to pump the brakes now on the Chiefs organization. Organization as a whole. They're one and two now, last place in the AFC West. They beat the Browns by four in week one, lost uh, to Ravens and Chargers back to back weeks. Their schedule gets easier coming up, so they will bounce back. But I do want to say no team stays this good forever. People are taking this offense for granted. They think Mahomes. Another 60-yard uh, touchdown season. He's going to throw for 5,000. Those things only happen a couple times in their career, and we can't take that for granted. If you have a Chiefs player, you need to check your lineup. You need to make sure they're starting. You need to make sure the matchup is good because it is no longer you know, 2020, 2019, where it set it and forget it on the Chiefs. Um, I spent two seasons. This was a free square in sportsbook in fantasy Lock in Travis Kelsey, lock in Mahomes. They're free squares. Now's the time to go back to scanning matchups because that is no longer the case. The Chiefs organ- the Chiefs defense over the last three seasons has looked worse than they are just because you need to throw on them because Patrick Mahomes has the team ahead. But now, Steve, this defense actually has problems. And although yep. the, the yardage totals and all that hasn't risen yet, you're going to see more consistently Chiefs are playing football games into the fourth quarter. So I do want to call out the Chiefs organization. Pump your brakes, guys. These is just a football team. They are human. They are coming back down to earth. Yeah, and and like the last two weeks, they've also been shooting themselves in the foot a lot. They've had chances to take or extend leads, but then have made costly uh, costly penalty. I mean, costly Turnovers. Penalties. You had Patrick Mahomes falling down, throwing the ball. Come on, you know better than that. Yeah. 
and, 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 you know, the thing is, is Tyreek Hill, he, he had 31.6 points in week one. Since then, he's had 5.9 and 6.2. Do you want to know who's been the leading receiver outside Travis Kelsey? It's been Mecole Hardman. Mecole Hardman, the last two weeks, has had 10.5 and 11 points, respectively. So if you don't have Mecole Hardman yet, I would highly suggest that, I mean, even with Josh Gordon there, I, I still say that Mecole is probably still locked in to be the number two. And no one is match proof anymore. Go with your tight end pick here. Yeah, um, I'm going with Kyle Pitts. I honestly believe that Pitts would be a top five tight end all season. He has a system in place that would allow him to be that top 10 tight end, top tier tight end, and he doesn't have to fight many people for targets. It should be him and Calvin Ridley just eating and feasting. But he is tight end 13 on the season. And, and you know, so far, fellow rookie tight end Pat Fryermuth on the Steelers is only 2.3 points behind him at tight end 16. And nobody was expecting Fryermuth to, to have such um, production like he's been having so far. In fairness, he's tight end 16. That's really not a ton of production. I know, but, but I, I take your, your words on Kyle Pitts to heart. We always talk about how long tight ends take to develop. It is one of the toughest positions in the league to play and Kyle Pitts was dead set he's not a wide receiver he's a tight end so why would he break out in year one well we just seem to ignore it he's a generational he talent we're in love with draft. him you don't fall in love with tight ends you date tight ends you don't fall in love <laughs> I'm just saying for the number five pick for the number five number five pick in the NFL draft compared to a second round rookie tight end the number five pick should be in your top it should be in your top seven at least you might think so, but this is the NFL, and they don't care about your fantasy football team. Let's talk about Ben Roethlisberger. Pumping the brakes on him. Um, he's been a statue for a long time in the NFL. Now he is a hurt statue in the NFL. Three touchdowns, three interceptions so far this season with eight sacks. Do yourself a favor. There is a GIF going around on Twitter. You can find it on Instagram. You can find it anywhere social media is. And it's him trying to make this diving pass. It is the most uncoordinated thing I've seen in my life. It looks like a four-year-old trying to throw a basketball. It is <laughs> gross. Take a look at that, Ben Roethlisberger. You got to pump your brakes. Old Big Ben, This, if this writing isn't on the wall, this is going to be like uh, Peyton Manning's last season. I um I I mean 11.02, 13.08 and 15.22 fantasy points. That that's what he's produced so far. He has long not been a fantasy target of mine, but this yeah. is like you could see him filling out his social security card. Yeah, he, he's he's quarterback 26 on the season. Uh, I mean, maybe there's a glimmer of hope when Deontay and Juju come back that this offense might click, but I'm not betting on it. I think that this is it. Um yeah, I, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to hop into mine. Uh, my next one, my last one is Javante Williams, the rookie running back. A lot of rookies today. Ooh, I, I, I'm i really hard on the rookies today, but oh well. Um, Javante, he's currently RB38 and so far has not impressed. He, is, he has gotten 50-50 splits with Melvin Gordon. And if you're in, if you're in a standard league right now, are you, are you going to be considering dropping him anytime soon? I don't think you can drop him because I think the trajectory for Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams is going to even out. But this is what I said all season long, all off season. Melvin Gordon is a good football player. No matter where he goes, he's done nothing but contribute. He's one of those mm -hmm. guys on my board, like like a Calvin, uh, like a uh, Carlos Hyde or something like that, where he just he's good no matter where he is. He's a good football player, and to think Javante Williams was going to step in from day one and be it, no. By week 16 in your fantasy playoffs, he might be it. But this was always going to happen. There was no other way this was going to track down. If you have Melvin Gordon, you got to give him the ball. He's just that talented. Yeah. Moving on, I am going to put my last pump the brakes on the New York Jets. Specifically, people coming onto our Sunday morning show and asking me start sit questions involving New York Jets players. Here's one for you. To play on the Jets, they play on your bench. No one on that team is worth starting. Nope. Zach Wilson, he has four, five, six, seven, seven interceptions over three games so far this season. One, four, and two. He only has two touchdowns during that span. 
and uh, just over five, 600 yards passing. So he's not doing it for anyone on this team. They can't move the ball. This offense suffers. Corey Davis had the best performance on the Jets last week. Five receptions for 41 yards. Nothing here is startable in fantasy. And if you come on my show and ask me what Jets you should start, it is none of them. Bench them. Bury them on your depth chart. Draft better. Draft better. And, and, and the thing is, is Tevin Coleman was out this week. So people were like, oh, man, Michael Carter, Michael Carter, Michael Carter. Michael Carter got nine carries and went nowhere with them. I absolutely love Michael Carter. I do, too. I don't love the Jets. Uh, yeah, I mean, and and I think that them losing, what, they lost three pieces on their offensive line, right? Yeah. Somewhere around there. I think that that does have something to do with it, but still. They were going to stink anyway. The Jets yeah. were always going to stink. I love Michael Carter, and I think by the end of the year, he may be someone to consider putting in your lineup. There are, are no set it, forget it. So there's no one I would rather have. Oh, would, would you rather have start? Not the Jet. No. Not the yeah. Jet. That's why I'd rather start. Yeah. Let's take a look at the rear view and some of the picks we made last week. The I-80 Sports Rear View where we take a look back at topics from last week's show. When we talk about last week's show, we're talking mostly about Sunday. We're here every Sunday live, 11 o'clock. We have guests, and we talk about uh, every matchup. We break down players to start, who has the best matchups. We do start sit questions. And I'm going to start with my most obscure referenced player, and that is Hunter Renfro versus the Dolphins. We mentioned how Dolphins have a very good secondary against the outside wide receivers, but are uh, able to be taken over the middle. And about how Waller is such so obvious, he's such an obvious uh, player to cover, to double cover, that Hunter Renfro in the slot on this team would have a good game. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, Renfro caught five of six for 77 and a touchdown. He's sitting at wide receiver 29 right now. He should not be on the waiver wire. He is firmly embedded as a wide receiver three. He's a better NFL player than he gets credit for. One of those Cole Beasley guys. I love me some Clemson. I love me some Hunter Renfro. And I loved him last week and I told you about it. Yeah. I mean, he, it's a solid, it's a solid pickup. Do you want to know, do you want to know who's right behind Hunter Renfro right now? Who? Calvin Ridley is one spot behind Hunter Renfro. Renfro has 34.4 and Calvin Ridley has 33.5. That I, won't last, but get both of them on your uh, roster. Oh my god. I projected I projected Calvin to be the number 1 in and right now Hunter Renfro is beating him. But I I mean since I wasn't on the Sunday live show, like I I if I was on the Sunday live show, I would have been one of those ones who would have said bench Alexander Madison because if you guys remember from the um early projection show, I was like Madison's just another guy. I don't I have zero faith in him. And what does he do? He goes out and he and he was one of the only running backs this week to score over 20 fantasy points. Only only seven players score only seven running backs scored more than 20 and and Madison was one of them. So when I'm wrong, I'm going to say I'm wrong. I was going to Madison got Bell Cow work 26 rushes, 112 yards, also six receptions for 59, 170 yards total. Didn't even fall into the end zone and was the top performers on the week. Alexander Madison, someone, you got to get him on your bench. If you don't have him, Dalvin Cook is going to miss another game or two this season. It may be next week. It may be down the line. He's just a hard runner. He's not built to withstand playing a 17-game uh, season. Alexander Madison's got to be owned in every format. This was favorable against the Seattle Seahawks, but he's one of the top handcuffs. We knew it. We drafted like it last year. People were swerving this offseason. Uh, swerve back. Swerve yeah. back. Yeah, I agree. Pick him up. Next, I'm going to talk about Naeem Hines, another obscure reference. I was really good at digging deep during the, my notes from last week. Again, on Sunday, I looked at Hines versus the Titans. Good matchup specifically for patch catching abilities. His line, six rushes for 25 yards and a touchdown. He also got five for 54 in the air. He was much more useful in the game than Jonathan Taylor, who went 10 for 64. Obviously, Jonathan Taylor is much more efficient, probably better, but Naeem Hines was a better weapon on the field for the Colts. So I absolutely love what Naeem Hines brought. I brought him to you, and if you uh, listened, you're rewarded with about 80 yards and a tutty. Yeah, I mean, the the Colts, they're, they're just terrible. 
Hera bad. Like they're, they're the only two players that you should even consider on this team right now are Naeem Hines and Michael Pittman Jr. If I was to make a call on anyone being right about, it, I was I was like, yeah, I think Michael Pittman Jr. will break out this year. And so far, he's done a good job over the last two weeks. But Naeem Hines, you know, he, he, he it was the same last year. He had a great week one, crappy week two. And then great week three and was up and down the rest of the season. So, you know, he's, he is a matchup based one, but he is definitely more valuable and, um, and gives you more value than Jonathan Taylor right now. And your last pick here for uh, looking in the rear room mirror last week's picks. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it was more for our draft, you know, I'm looking that far back and that's sure. DeAndre Swift because, you know, it, when Etienne went down, I, I was caught, I remember that dilemma that you we yeah. I was caught up in. Should I stick with um, Swift as my keeper or Robinson? I'm sure glad that I kept Swift over Robinson because I was worried Swift was going to have too many injury concerns. But Swift so far has been fantastic and is currently the running back number four on this year so far. Absolutely love it, Steve. Any final thoughts as we head into Week Four in the NFL? um? I mean. <laughs> no, 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 not really. I mean, we uh, we've had great uh, matchups. We're coming to the what was the official quarter poll of the season, and like I'm just I'm just excited for all the matchups that we have coming up this week. We'll see what happens, and we'll see you on Sunday. Have a great week.